lights and torches. <laughs> oh. <laughs> So I think, Yasha, Karen, are you are going to move on to our three forms of light. Forms <laughs> of light. <laughs> okay, so it's some of the terms that Amishi um, uses to explain things. So uh, within uh, psychology and neuroscience, there are some different systems set up around attention. Uh, so attention is about prioritising things. So the first system that she talks about, she describes as a flashlight or a torch. So within neuroscience, this would be the orienting system. It's easier for us to sort of kind of think about a word and an image of, of a torch. So it's focusing our attention and it uh, prioritizes based on content. So that's the focus of the flashlight. So it's that thing where we're shining a light. I want to look at this particular thing right here. That's interesting me. Yeah. Or that's really, really important. So that's the flashlight. So the second thing that she talks about is a floodlight. So this would be the, uh, in neuroscience, it would be the alerting system. So this system is prioritizing based on time. So it's what's immediate right now. So she tells a little story about how you can think about it being like a, a floodlight outside that's got a motion sensor on it. So it comes on now. It's like, okay, what's happening right now? Usually it's a cat walking past our door. I don't know what happens in your place, but that's, that's how it works here. Um, but it's a broad, receptive kind of awareness. Yeah? It's observational. Yeah, and it's, it's in the moment. And the third thing she talks about is the juggler. So this would be the executive command. So the juggler is managing everything, keeping all the balls going and making sure that goals and actions are in alignment. So that's the job of the juggler. So those are three things that she will mention uh, throughout the clip. So the flashlight, the floodlight, and the juggler. And she talks, doesn't she, about how, uh, you know, under ideal or reasonably ideal circumstances, we have the capacity to choose where to shine our flashlight mm -hmm. or torch. It's like, okay, I'm paying attention to Savannah D talking right now, you know, um, and the juggler the sort of management or executive management system um, is able to uh, recall our kind of goals and our intentions and make sure that our actions are aligned with them. And this floodlight would be kind of soft and open and receptive. We, we can just sort of, you know, we've got a, we can have that broad sense of awareness and then choose from there where we might direct our flashlight. Uh, and of course, those are ideal circumstances. And I think many of us these days would have the sense of, um, <laughs> like quite often not really having that degree of uh, ownership of our attention actually that it just like wanders um and I, I know this came up quite strongly for me actually towards the end of last year when we'd been locked down in Auckland for a really long time at that point and I started <laughs> I started Googling it actually, as you do, um, because I was like, I, I feel like this is somehow a, a thing that's connected with, you know, what is going on in relation to the pandemic lockdowns. And sure enough, there was a sense of people broadly noticing this diminishment of attentional uh, capacity of our, our ability to actually like direct the flashlight. Um, the ability of the juggler to, to keep on, you know, keep track of things. Uh, and so uh, we're going to move into a clip now where she talks about what happens to our attention when we are under stress. And she actually uses particularly a word that comes more from kind of military first response, uh, <laughs> that sort of world. Um, and she talks about the stress as VUCA. That is an acronym. Um, v means volatile. U stands for uncertain. C stands for complex. And A stands for ambiguous. So volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. 
VUCA and uh, we'll move into this first clip where she talks about actually what does happen to our attention uh, when VUCA is at play. Let's not, let's put VUCA to the side for a moment. You can decide where you want to walk. Uh, I'm sorry, where you want to point the flashlight. Let's say you're walking down a darkened path. You want to direct it toward the space in front of you so you can yeah. maneuver. Yeah. But if there was a weird sound or a strange sound or howling or something like that, you're going to take that flashlight and immediately direct it to where you thought the sound came from. Very healthy and normal thing to yeah. do. So it has the capability of directing, but it can automatically be pulled or yanked as well. And yeah. so these features, that's when I, when I said that under VUCA circumstances, you can't keep it steady. It could be that it's constantly being pulled in these other directions by external stimuli or internally generated stimuli. Yeah. Or, and those, by the way, would be people that we might even describe as having attention deficit disorder. They cannot keep the flashlight steady. Okay. But in, con in the context of something like depression, for example, the flashlight is is now stuck on certain kinds of mental content and it cannot extract itself away when it needs to be doing something else. So it could be depressogenic or negative thoughts. It's stuck on there. So both of those would be kind of examples of distractibility, but definitely dysfunction. And we see the same thing with these yeah. other two systems under under these VUCA circumstances. The floodlight is not just like broad and receptive to what's going on in the moment, but it's hyper vigilant. You have that sense of of the need to actually prepare yourself for something in everything you do in your life. And this yeah. is what we often see with anxiety and post-traumatic stress disorders, that that amped right. up floodlight on everything, almost blinding you, um, is what's experienced. And then yeah. finally, under these kind of VUCA circumstances, um, the, the juggler is not keeping all the balls in the air. The balls are dropping. Uh, you can't maintain goals. Um, you can't shift when there's an update required, um, and you certainly cannot ensure that your behavior and your goals align. Sorry, took me a moment to unmute myself there. I've lost my button. <laughs> so I think there's something really interesting um, for me there about uh, that point about you can't make sure that your behavior and your goals align in terms of just intentionality at work. But um, she was talking there about almost quite extreme circumstances. So actually beforehand, she's talked about this is what's happening in um, military first response sort of situations. And she's talking about people with clinical depression, people with ADHD. Uh, but of course, these kind of um, circumstances, it's like VUCA is a scale, if you like, you know, we're not always at that extreme end of it. Uh, so if we, in a way that means it applies to all of us, I think it's probably quite, quite relatable what she described there. And I thought VUCA stands for quite big words. If we kind of break that down a little bit more, we get we start with volatile and there's a sense of you know it sort of means change and specifically change that's liable to be fast and um, quite possibly for the worst <laughs> uncertain has this kind of flavor of unknowability right complex means that there's um lots of related uh things going on so there is that sense of kind of interdependence at work and ambiguous meaning things aren't black and white you know it, like whatever is going on is open to potentially multiple um, interpretations so when we get into change sort of unknowability and interdependence it's starting to sound a lot like the marks of conditioned existence you know just the nature of the world in which we live. Uh, so in a way, we have this capacity to be in VUCA all of the time. <laughs> um, but sometimes, you know, it's felt much more strongly than others. Uh, and I think, interestingly, she talks about VUCA being with us wherever we go. But I think perhaps from a Buddhist perspective, we would just say, you know, like, 
it's it's the nature of life change is in the nature of life interdependence is in the nature of life uh and um she sort of also speaks to this point that like, this idea that the, in the modern world we have a particular crisis of attention in a way it's simply not true it's just like because we have this ability to attend to things and because of the nature of the world and the nature of our untrained minds uh the crisis of attention is not here because we are um you know bombarded by social media and new 24-hour news cycles and all that sort of thing it's uh it's not unique to this moment and that even if we have this dream uh yes karina that we might um simply move to a nice monastic setting or into a solitary retreat hut on the side of the mountain and not be affected <laughs> by distraction <laughs> and vuka uh it's kind of unlikely i don't know what your experience has been of that yes karina is it the magic magic ticket <laughs> unfortunately not a consistently magic ticket no mm. no i mean uh it is so interesting that we, it's that thing where we're never quite satisfied. We think there's going to be some other, other thing that's going to make it all better or make it all work perfectly for us. And this is, is patently not the case. <laughs> um, and I, I think there's also a thing in here for me about our expectations and assumptions, you know, that we assume I'm going to go on retreat and have this marvellous experience for the full 10 days. It's going to be marvellous. And... And, you know, but we've brought a stream of other things uh, with us and then our mind will also be running off uh, to other things. And I think also with the whole VUCA thing, there's also, uh, there's a balance for us to be trying to make with appropriate responses to things that arise. We can, you know, Tend, sometimes maybe we, we can know for ourselves that we have a tendency to over overreact to things or to maybe just try and ignore things. But, um, yeah, in a way, um, yeah, it's, it's about finding that path and coming to terms with the fact that these things will happen. They will happen. Things out of our control will happen, both internally and externally, so that thoughts will arise. Yeah, yeah. and that this is... Yeah, that's the nature in a way, <laughs> yeah. like uncertain, uncertainty and change are of the nature of life mm -hmm. and it's of the nature of our attention when that mm -hmm. is particularly, um, uh, you know, there's particularly strong experiences of that. It's of the nature of our attention to kind of uh, degrade a bit, <laughs> if you <laughs> like. And then she also talks about this thing that there are, there are things that we can do and particularly that like, maintaining daily mindfulness practice or meditative practice is like keeping our fuel tanks or the fuel tanks of our attention kind of topped up um and she talks in her book in fact is in the title 12 minutes a day and to be clear she is absolutely saying that is the minimum to get any actual uh like observable uh benefit in the lab so ideally you would do much more but the, like 12 minutes of practice a day would help keep your attention and in, in slightly better shape um and then there are kind of things we can do because we're always going to have mm. in a way uh internal chatter you know we live in a in a world we're not in a monastic setting we're not we're not living a contemplative life in the traditional sense, you know, it's like we are actually dealing with um, deadlines, probably, <laughs> in our work. Uh, so there are other things that we can do in the moment. And Yasha Karina and I particularly like the way she um, explained kind of practicing when we become aware uh, that we are being completely pulled by distraction and our attention is suffering. Where uh yeah do you want to say something else about that yes karina or... no look i think i think we, we can move to the other clip just to say that this is one of those occasions in the world where more is better mm. <laughs> and you know one approach would be to 
distance oneself. So if you want to look at what's going on right now and not be locked into the story that the mind has created or a particular detail about the environment, et cetera, you've got to step away from it. And, and attention cannot be in multiple places at once. So you're either in the middle of a very intense and difficult emotion, or you're watching that you are, that, that, that one, that the experience of a difficult mo emotion has arisen, but you cannot be in both places at once. Uh, oh, fully. Yeah. So in some sense, yeah. pulling away, and that's what DeCenter is talking about, uh, is taking this observational stance explicitly by psychologically distancing oneself. And that doesn't mean closing off or denying it. It's more like, and again, this is where, you know, having children and describing what this is to them is very helpful. I'd say to them, it's sort of like being a, a um, I don't know if you have this in the, in the UK, but I'm sure you do, like a traffic helicopter, right? So you're hovering above, maybe there's a bit, do you have this, is this a common thing where th that sometimes on the TV, they might have a helicopter in the sky kind of looking down on what's happening in a particular circumstance, like a busy road and saying, oh, this, you know, this particular intersection has been blocked well, up. Maybe in London, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah sure, so yeah. So a traffic yeah. helicopter or a drone, let's say, or a bird, you know, depending on what you want to say, yeah. or a fly yeah. on the wall. The point is, you are somewhere else and you're watching what's going Anything on. Anything can fly. <laughs> a fly, a bird, um, a drone. It's just, you know, there's so many different ways that you could approach this, but the point yeah. is there yeah. is a distance between the experience as it's unfolding and a reporting of that experience in a kind of third person or objective manner. So it would Right. Be so if you're so if you're if you're aware that you're stressed, you can't be in the middle of stress anymore because the, by definition there's distance and therefore you're in a sense this is what I guess what you mean by detended. You're not centered anymore in the, in the middle of that stress. You're observing it from above, and therefore, in that sense, you're not stressed in that moment. Well, so you speak. are going to be well. You are, and, and you aren't, right? So you're basically, if you think about what kind of at a granular level would happen, you're in the middle of a very overwhelmed situation. You've got a deadline, and you can't make it, and you feel that like I'm never going to get this done. Yeah. That internal chatter starts building up, and then you're so lost in the internal chatter that you're not even doing the thing that is the cause of that stress which is getting the project yes. done, right so yes. you see you're, that you're in a loop like you're stuck you're overwhelmed you're almost paralyzed and so then that would be the moment to say ah maybe i need a little bit of distance here and so the distance would be not denying the moment it's just mm. taking a little pause away from that direct experience of it and saying what is actually going on in this moment amishi is feeling that she will not make this deadline i mean she mm. cares about this uh, deadline she's feeling mm. a uh, you know, whatever, she's feeling tightness in her jaw or her heart's beating faster. I'm using a third person perspective. So I'm, cause I'm watching yeah. it. I'm the reporter watching what's going yeah. on. I'm describing it factually, not, I'm not justifying conceptually elaborating. It's like, if I weren't me and I had to see if I was watching the situation, what could I say is going on? If I were, um, you know, just taking a kind of a raw data of the experience. And just doing that does provide that psychological distance, but it also kind of dials down the intensity of the directly experienced emotion. And then, then you can kind of get your head back together to say, okay, now where do I need to focus to get this report done? But so it's not denying or not experiencing it. It's, it's just yeah. experiencing it from this other perspective. Yeah. So that's, it's such a, an interesting way I think of taking ourselves out of the middle of that kind of situation that's kind of like an overwhelm that she's she's describing to actually take that that step back. So just to be really clear, she's not saying that we're not experiencing what's going on. We are still experiencing it, but we're not kind of caught up in it and overwhelmed by it. So we're taking a more observational stance. I think it's really interesting. We both thought it was really interesting that she she talked about it in that third third person kind of way to help us take that little bit of space, get a little bit more space back to describe. You know, you know, Yash Karen's feeling a little bit anxious here on into on on Zoom with all these people looking at her from little boxes. You know, it, it, it's that kind of that kind of feeling to it, um, and it's just so important for us to be able to take that little pause, take that little space and to find ways of doing it. And I do think that observational approach is really useful. The other, one of the other really interesting things that she said there is basically speaking about 
um, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Anyway, the fact that multitasking isn't really a thing, that um, we can't have our attention in two places at once fully. So that's what she said. She adds that word fully. Yeah, because actually what we're doing is we're task switching. This one, this one. Our attention is jumping from one to the other. Yeah. So um, I think that has... Uh, you know, that would be really important, you know, if if uh, people could be a little more aware of that. I think even for myself, I think I'm doing, I've really got, you know, but, and, and I thought, you know, saying that um, you can't be in two places at once, I thought that was very generous because I'm pretty sure that sometimes I think I can actually do way more than two things at once. Um, <laughs> it's true. I love the language of task <laughs> switching, actually, and even you doing that kind of makes me feel exhausted you know it's like a new thing when the brain gets when we we talk a lot i think within true hatner about feeling full up we'll even say it on retreats sometimes it's like everyone looks a bit like they're full up let's just you know do something simple or just sit or something and there's that sense of oh yeah you get full up doing that yeah so um speaking of fill up in a way <laughs> and this is a, a a wild transition in a way she says some very very interesting things about um memory and specifically as attention being the doorway to memory and here she introduces another image which is of the mental whiteboard and i quite like that it's like so you know if you think about whiteboards they've got limited space right you 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 ask people in a class, for instance, I, we ask them to call out things and eventually you run out of room on the whiteboard. Uh, and she talks about being, if anyone's a sort of computery person, the whiteboard is a bit like a temporary scratch space uh, before things get encoded or committed to memory. And she, like these are, she does point out that she's talking in very simplistic terms for those of us who are not neuroscientists. There are, you know, cases that don't fall into this. So the question is like, how do things get written onto the whiteboard uh, in order for us to recollect them in a way? They get written by being the kind of focus of our consciousness in the moment. And I think that's really important because actually, if you think about us kind of thinking that we can be in two places at once <laughs> and task switching a lot, it's like, one, really, do we have uh, any particular focus? What's happening there? But importantly, it means that like, if you're sitting here now listening to me talk, but actually what you're really doing is kind of ruminating or going over and over in your mind, say an argument you've just had with your partner or a friend or something like that. Where your consciousness, where the focus of your attention truly is, is on that rumination. So you're not going to remember, really, the chances of you remembering anything I'm saying right now are next to nothing. Because what's being written to your mental whiteboard is whatever the rumination, you know, whatever that thought train is in your head, you're writing that over and over and over again. Uh, and you're filling up the whiteboard. So we have this really interesting relationship between our attention and memory or we might say between distraction and uh, a lack of memory. Uh, I think this brought to mind for Yasha Karana a particular Rumi poem, which... <laughs> yeah, because what, what she's also saying is that if you're not fully present to a moment, then you're not going to remember it. So that's the point that in this, in this Rumi, Rumi poem. And it says... Do not look back, my friend. No one knows how the world began. Do not fear the future. Nothing lasts forever. If you dwell on the past or in the future, you will miss the moment. It's putting it in very simple but beautiful terms, isn't it? <laughs> and we miss 
the moment all the time. There's a lavely part in the interview between Amala Vedra and Dr. Jar actually, where they're, they're talking about how if you think that capturing a photo will be a substitute for being present, it's like it won't work. You'll, you'll end up with a picture, but you won't have any kind of, in a way, memories associated. You know, if you've ever checked through your holiday snaps, for instance, and you're like, oh gosh, it's another picture of a beach and a tree, but which one? Who knows? Why did they take this? You know, you're probably just sort of in a bit of default, like capture the moment mode. Um, I think too, there's something really, you know, the obvious link here is the sense that mindfulness in a way is like always involves um, a sense of being able to recollect our purpose and recollect what's going on. So of course, this um, training ourselves to learn to come to be more present and um, yeah, is just so important. But interestingly, um, she doesn't go on to say that this mental whiteboard as such, it's not just affecting our memory. Um, so it supports our memory in a lot of ways, but it also, um, her research is kind of showing that it affects um, our mood, uh, our emotional reactivity, uh, and also a sense of what she describes as kind of like buoyancy in the mind or a sense of like positivity. Buoyancy for me sort of yeah, implies that um, positivity, but also kind of flexibility in a way. So there's something about this whiteboard filling up that is going to negatively like impact those things, which I think is really, really interesting. Um, and so again, like what she has this beautiful way of talking about what we do <laughs> to like clear or keep some uh, spaces on this mental whiteboard, so to speak. Mm. Yeah, so the mental, the, the whiteboard is supported by something she describes as white spaces. And the white spaces are also supporting uh, our memory. So it, it, we're, going to just, we're just about going to play another clip, but she does refer to something that was spoken about just before that, which was a, an example that was given about being in the, the queue at the supermarket. And for some people, that might be a cue to whip out your phone or, or you know, check something. Or, but actually, it's an opportunity to just, just be in the space and allow some, you know, your mind to wander in a positive sense. So we'll, we'll play the clip and she'll explain to us a little more about white spaces. So the first thing to say is if you never allow that white space in your life, where you're always doing task to task to task to task, just like you said in the context of standing in line at a mm. grocery store, you may be denying your opportunity for spontaneous thought that may support your own mm. memory to later be mm -hmm. better represented. Yeah. So that's one consequence. The other thing is that we know when people don't have these white spaces, and I just mean by white spaces, there's no task. It's not that you're having off task thought, it's that you don't have a dedicated task that you're trying to do. It's almost like giving the juggler a break, saying, Jug you don't have to yeah. manage right now, just there is no requirement, right? And so if we think about this as what you do when you say you're daydreaming, right? Usually you're sitting in, uh, you're sitting or walking somewhere, there's no particular thing you need to figure out, or um, mm -hmm. you, know, you don't even have a particular recurring thought or worry. It's just letting the mind do whatever arises you know if you if the sound of a bird captures your attention oh look at that a bird or you know yeah. you have some grumble you know some kind of grumbling in your stomach oh look at that i might be hungry you're just allowing the mental content to appear and you're not constraining it or controlling it in any way when people do this not only will their memory likely be better but we know that their mood is going to improve we know that their creativity may be better supported and 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 they'll feel sort of this sense of um I don't know, general positivity and, and buoyancy, mentally buoyant. So there is a real value in doing it. And this is where I think the cost yeah. of a, a highly technological 24-7 uh, life can be very problematic because it may not feel like it, but what you're doing when you pick up your phone and you look at it is you are now in a task context. The task is whether it's even something you think is, is fun, like, oh, I'm just going to go on social media and see what's going on. Well, now the task is observe yeah. what's going on, engage with yeah. it. If you have some kind of feedback from something you've written, respond to it. 
um, catch up with what somebody's uh, posted, et cetera. So all of, or if it's email, forget it. That's very yeah. tasks focused yes, because you're actually course, having yeah. to think and generate and you are not giving this spontaneous thought any moments to arise. And it, um, and it will cost you in some sense. Oh, there's a, in a way, it's a little challenge for us, isn't it, to uh, see if we can find some more white space in our lives. I mean, she has that, you know, list of things uh, that people might do. I, I, when Suvana D and I were, were talking about this, I kind of said, well, actually, you know, how many times do we go on retreat and we fill up the space with reading a very worthy book while we're on retreat? <laughs> Whereas we could maybe take that space to just just be and let whatever's going to arise from whatever we've been doing and experiencing on retreat arise. So even, you know, sometimes we could be filling up those potential white spaces with something that could be very kind of worthy or useful, mm. but to also give value to um, just having that space. She also describes things that we can do so in terms of... Uh, procedural activities. So that might be, for example, going for a walk. But she's also really clear, I think it's really important that there's also uh, attitude is, is vital here because going for a walk could be, even going for the same walk could be really different depending on our attitude. You know, are we ruminating, you know, dwelling in the past or in the future as we're walking or are we actually just walking and allowing ourselves to experience things as they arise uh, on the walk. Yeah, so those kind of procedural activities can be useful, but still need you still remember that you bring yourself with you. So what 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 attitude are we bringing with us? And one of the other things she mentions is uh, activities with low attentional demand. This is one of my favorite kinds of white activities, white, white space times is low attentional demand. People who know me will know that I'm a, I'm a bit of a crafter. So even with something like creating something, it can be a really focused activity. You know, I've got to have the right number of stitches or this heel on this sock is just not going to turn out. Okay, so that's not a low attentional demand activity. But if I'm just calmly creating a beanie for charity and I'm just going round and round it kind of calms everything it allows everything to just fall into it's kind of like the repetition that's echoed in the body so like that repetition of the heartbeat that repetition of breathing so something that soothes us so it's those kinds of activities I know I've seen some people on here with pets so it could be something like sitting, stroking a pet, something that doesn't demand a lot of mental attention. So th things that still allow the brain to kind of have its own space. Um, so these are really, uh, yeah, really important things for us. And, and I think in modern life, we tend not to give them enough value and and time mm. yeah i think i've never heard such good clear reasoning uh for doing nothing actually <laughs> 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 you know, okay. or embracing what sangharachita the sort of founder of our community referred to as a greater mandala of uselessness but just like the importance she makes it so clear in a way you now have a um scientific backing if you needed it <laughs> to cut, like just put a bit of time aside for a spot of, of daydreaming or um yeah stroking the cat or but that actually that's incredibly important for our memory our emotional well-being you know all the things that kind of support us and actually i think a kind of like uh, an important foundation for us to build on our on our dharma practice really you know if you have if you have low mood and you feel very pressured and you're struggling to remember things it's very very hard to um to sort of go any deeper i think um 
Yeah, I was like one thing I've really enjoyed in response to this because I know Amla Vedra in the clip talks about having uh, put aside as a sort of precept 12 minutes a day. The 12 minutes was just a fluke uh, that it was <laughs> coincidental that he'd picked that number. Uh, and so I started doing this after listening to this clip because like I'm so bad at giving priority to anything that isn't kind of like um, goal oriented, you know, I think we're deeply conditioned in our society to like our actions, everything we do needs to have a purpose and an outcome. Uh, and so I will uh, always prioritize those things. And it's been really interesting just to carve out 12 minutes in a day, um, quite intentionally to do like just let my mind wander wherever it wants to go and i'm not actually doing anything i pretty much just like lounge around you know <laughs> it's just kind of fascinating to see what comes up and she talks about the spontaneous thought you know just noticing the things that pop into your mind you suddenly and, and things start to become sometimes really mundane things which i think we all have probably experienced through mindfulness practice mundane things start to sort of jump out at you more. It's just like space gets created. Um, and then she also, of course, goes on to say that we, in a way, it's not just about like formally making time for these things, but there are those opportunities like in the supermarket queue, that is an opportunity for just a few minutes to get back a little bit, like to clear that mental whiteboard a little bit, <laughs> to get back a bit of flexibility and, um and and positivity mm. and yeah just you know a, a little bit more of a sense of mental spaciousness there was actually one funny it was an interesting incident savannah d and i were on a zoom meeting talking about organizing this and my partner damasara was kind of motioning to me from over there and i thought what is going on and he said you've got to come over here for a minute and he took me over to the, this other window over in the house and there's this enormous bright rainbow with another echo of the rainbow behind. It was like, just sometimes just take the moment, just, you know, yeah. take yourself out. And then I could come back and tell Savannah D about this amazing rainbow. And then we continued on. But yeah, take the moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. But, um, and you did very well to take that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think many of us would under those circumstances. I'm busy. This <laughs> is very important right now. Um, in reality, the rainbow was, in fact, more important. Um, <laughs> led to more creativity. But, you know, like this, why is it, why is it so hard for us um, to actually give any priority or weight to kind of like just non goal oriented, just open, useless <laughs> tasks. And I find it fascinating that in a way, science telling me it's useful can be a helpful <laughs> prompt to practice. <laughs> but anyway, um, so there's this wonderful part where Amala Vedra asks Amishi Jar effectively, like, you know, like, it's boring. Like, tell me, what is boredom? Have you got any insights for how to make this practice easier? So we'll go to the fourth clip now and uh, hear what she has to say. And, and as a neuroscientist, do you have an, an answer to that other question? Like, why is that so hard? Like, why, why do we get you know, in a sense, what is boredom? You know, yeah. what is that? <laughs> yeah, in many ways, you know, it's interesting because people think of boredom as the cause for something like well you know it's the reason i have to stop doing this because because but i don't think that's why i don't know this i mean I'm, this is now i'm speculating um i think okay. boredom is a feedback system so we as uh human beings needed some way to snap us out of what we're doing to see the opportunity costs before us and by opportunity costs i mean what else could I be doing right now? Or yes. should I be doing right now? Yeah. To even ask the question, I need to turn my attention somewhere else. There had to be something that was slightly noxious in our phenomenology that would say, this is not comfortable, I need to switch. So uh, right. why does that this is not comfortable a feeling arise? Um, partly it just could be that doing the same thing over and over has an aspect of that to it as a mechanism to get you to check out that you don't, in, in our evolutionary ancestors days, 
don't get eaten. Make sure you're aware of the weather. Oh, Take shelter true. if you need to. Yeah. Just something that arises that cues you to says, what's going on right now? Is there something else I should be doing instead? That I think is what we consider now boredom because boredom is essentially right. saying to us, the current situation is unsatisfactory and action must be taken, mm -hmm. right? So if we yeah. realize, ah, it's the mind showing me that feedback, we can make a, we can make a choice in that moment. Yeah. I mean, sure, the feedback is boredom. There's nothing intrinsic in some sense about that feeling. It's just a feeling like any other. Um, and I can question and determine what I want to do based on it's arising. Yeah, I think that's a really critical point that we can question and determine what we want to do based on it's arising. I think in some ways what she's talking about here is Vedana, you know, mm -hmm. just the feeling tone of our experience. And I was thinking this week, um, well, this whole month actually for me has been a little bit uh, overly ambitious in terms of how many things are in my diary. <laughs> and I was sitting this week preparing for this while at the same time knowing I needed to get my car across town to be fixed reasonably shortly. And then I was also, it was in the back of my mind that I needed to organize about three things for an event this weekend. And so I'm trying to concentrate on listening to this interview and at the same time of course my like my brain it, it, it's, it was just this like really unpleasant feeling tone like oh no there's there's something else I'm supposed to be doing mm. um and in just noticing that going God, like okay this is like quite it's, it's unpleasant Vedana basically um I was able to make a choice in that moment about whether, you know, because under different circumstances or with a lack of awareness, probably what I find myself doing is leaping out of my seat to go and do something else. You know, when you get that restlessness kind of creeping in, like, I'll make a cup of tea, I'll do this, I'll do this, I'll do this. <laughs> and instead, you know, when you identify it for what it is, whether it's unpleasant Vedana or like, oh God, I'm kind of a little bit bored right now, which is often just a response to sort of, neutral Wagner, <laughs> um, then it's like just bringing that awareness in and thinking, do I actually need, do I really need to make any change to what I'm doing is like quite a freeing thing, I think. I, like, I kind of wonder how many of our choices day to day, which might seem really uh, like minor in the grand scheme of things, the I accidentally watched two and a half hours of Netflix when I only meant to watch one, what it, whatever it is, you know, those are the easy go to examples. Like they start to have bigger impacts in our lives in terms of what our, our actual intentions for our lives are or how we really want to spend our time. Something really interesting um, about this area. Yeah, it is, it is really interesting and also uh, sometimes I think we were responding uh, and there could be things that are maybe even unconscious and we can sometimes kind of feel them in the body. There's something that's making it, there's that imperative to actually even get up and do something, to go and move, to get away or move closer to something. Um, and we maybe, you know, allowing that bit more of white space even to say okay what what's actually going on here what is that thing in my body what what is going on here is there something that if i give a little bit of space is it going to arise and can i then make a conscious decision about how i respond to something instead of just going oh no, i don't want that i'll go and do this other thing over here mm -hmm. um yeah, and that sense of discomfort mm. as a, a, a driver of our actions, like even when we're in a conversation and somebody says something that makes us uncomfortable, you know, our immediate impulse, it's like felt in my body often, it's like, this is wrong, something needs to change. It's like, does it? Or yeah. is this an opportunity to be open to something completely different, even though it perhaps feels a little bit mm. uncomfortable? Yeah, and even things like, you know, maybe something does need to be said and if you're feeling if there's a fear inside you of saying it, it's like, well, sometimes you need to go, oh, okay, it's just fear. I can't actually say this thing out loud. I don't need to kind of push it down and just, just stay small. So, yeah, I think that there is a lot. There's a lot in there. 
Yeah. <laughs> which is why it's kind of one of the questions we're going to give you. <laughs> Indeed, which we are very belated in getting to. So now would be a good time, wouldn't it? <laughs> so I think we are going to post them in the chat, probably as a link. I'll see what Nyana Mudra chooses to a Google Doc or a PDF. So you can actually click on it and load them. And that way, when we go into um, our breakout rooms, you'll still be able to see them because they are quite long. Apologies for that. So our first question is, do you have pauses and spaces in your life? Times when you might do something, but there's no specific goal and nothing to figure out. And importantly, you're not accidentally, it's just kind of unconsciously in task mode, like, like just checking the messages on your phone, you know? And where are the opportunities to create more white spaces? And the example we've already given is that, that habitual pull to look at your phone. You know, when somebody leaves the table at a cafe to go to the bathroom or something, and like, it's like, it could be a moment. Our second question. Uh, so we're giving a quote uh, from Amishi Ja here, where she's saying, there's nothing intrinsic in some sense about that feeling being boredom. It's just a feeling like any other. And I can question and determine what I want to do based on its arising. So just by way of a reflection starter, what is your response to this? And how do you imagine your life might be different if you saw the arising of boredom or unpleasant, pleasant, neutral feeling tone as a prompt to make a choice rather than a, an essential kind of immediate push to action? I think she's. Just out of curiosity, Joe, Joe and Nagashuri, did you get prompted? Um, did you get forced to come back as in you timed out or did you choose to come back and you still had some time left? We got the message that we had 60 seconds. So we oh, did, okay. uh, uh, you know, say goodbye to one another. Over yeah. to you, Joe. Yeah, same. There was a, cool. a breakout room button to come back. Yeah, cool. So we might see some people in a few more seconds or this might be us. <laughs> Thanks very much, Yana Mudra. Oh, my pleasure. We about 60 seconds, so we're all back. <clears throat> oh, we are all back. Yes, great. Okay, so uh, I suppose that this is a space really for questions, if there are any, and you're welcome to either put your hand up using the easiest thing for Nyana Mudra's sake is the, um, is to use the reactions button and raise your hand in the in the zoom manner if you have questions um, or you can pop them in the chat and we make no promises but we can uh, <laughs> we can see what spontaneously and creatively arises in response to your questions uh, and if there are none it might just be interesting to hear back from someone from each group actually as to what kind of uh what themes emerged for you in relation to this material during your breakout groups I've... i just wanted to ask if there is a link for the original interview can we watch it in full yeah yes. is it in the email uh i don't think so one moment it is on the nature of mind website you need to scroll down a little bit and you'll get to it so just i'll just pop the link for that in the i can click the right button in the chat room
Oh, thanks, Liz. Liz has popped the straight YouTube link in there. Okay. Just to say, there are other interviews with her available online yeah. as well. And of course, if you do want to see more of her stuff, you could read her book, which I haven't done, but that can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the book is called Peak Mind, um, and it's it was very recently released, so it should be relatively straightforward to find, actually. So I'm not seeing any particular questions, so I am going to... Oh, there is one. There we go. Oh, a hand there up. is? Yep. Perna and Marlene have their collective uh, hand Good up. on you. Perna and Marlene. <laughs> Um, I just wondered about whether there was other ways of looking at this question of white space. One of the issues that came up of, in our group was, of course, well, both pain and pain management, which you might have some opinions about, um, but also the tendency to revert to social media in potential white spaces like public transport or um, gaps mm. in the day that are enforced in some way. Mm. Um, well, I think to the second part of that, um, to some extent, you know, like uh, you're going to have to find motivations for practice. So I think if you did take it on as a bit of a, just take it on as a total experiment for like a week, like when I am on the train or whatever your public transport is, um, or when I'm in the supermarket queue, I'm going to consciously like feel that impulse to pull out the phone as a matter of habit. We've trained ourselves very well to do that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to deliberately not follow that impulse and and pay attention to whether you notice like any kind of change in your experience because i think that can ultimately be the only motivating factor that keeps us going you know it's like what i noticed was that actually quite quickly i went from feeling a bit overloaded and frazzled to just a sense of there being more mental space uh and a little bit a bit more steady and stable and grounded actually um so if you take that on as an experiment um, and then observe the effects. I think that's the only way you can deal with the pull of social media. You just have to commit to it. There's no way around it. Um, and, and giving up, you know, like giving up devices and uninstalling things, it, it doesn't really work long term either. So we need to find ways in our lives to do that. The first part, other ways to look at white space. Uh, you specifically mentioned um, pain management and I suppose that's an interesting one where we would probably come back again to the the realm of Vedana I perhaps what would you I mean my thinking Yasha Karana would be that with regards to mindfulness and pain management what we tend to say is that you know we need to allow that that pain and unpleasant sort of feeling tone of it into our awareness but we also then need to in a way go looking for more like that's not the whole of our experience like we can focus in on that that's that focused flashlight right that's just like stuck on pain we can sort of consciously choose to start looking for something else and in that kind of opening up we create a bit more space i think that's you know we open up to consciously looking for something pleasant even if it's literally like the color of a pink jacket hanging over there in my room, you know, is pleasant. That in itself just is that opening up again. What would you think, Yes, Karen? Yeah, I was going to say you could also even go kind of the other way with pain. It depends on your kind of pain as well. So sometimes we can have that thing where we think uh, it's all pain, the whole back is pain, it's just pain. Whereas if we, um, and if we create a bit of space around that, we might then find that it's actually particular pain or in a particular spot. So then it can actually give us more choice in where we actually have a look and say, actually, what's going on in this point here? So, so it can kind of be kind of work 
both ways in a way, because it can help, that space can give us maybe more specific information that's useful to work with, you know, in terms of pain management or what's actually going on instead mm. of us just being sort of overwhelmed in a way. We can actually be more specific and go, okay, I'll just look it up. Let me look at this point and see what's going on. So. Yeah. And that helps to overcome that kind of sense of like subtle resistance where we're not actually very aware of what's going on. We're just overwhelmed or yeah, exactly. <laughs> a bit full, actually, but yeah. of what we don't know. Yeah. Does that um, go some way towards answering your question, Berna? Yes, thank you both. That was very useful from both of you. Thanks. So Shraddhanaya. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody, and thanks so much. I just wanted to, just from my own experience and also what I understand is I think sometimes distraction is protectively very positive. And I think mm -hmm. I know for myself, I need to sit with myself and know what's best. And sometimes that involves um, creating opportunities to create positive emotion before I sit in the white space. So, and I know that's still a construction, but sometimes I think it's about having that sense of self-awareness of where you're actually up to. Likewise, I know there's understandings of sitting with pain, exploring the pain, but it may be also useful to um, create opportunities of building the emotion, the meta or the positive emotion before turning towards and just having that self-awareness in my view. Mm. I, I suppose from a pain management perspective, we would say that in a way that turning towards is is done with a great sense of kind of kindness and tenderness like in itself. It's an act of, it is an act of meta. I, I do think there is a place at times for positive distraction. I think a really important thing that she's, you know, just for example, if we're in an intense emotional, emotionally challenging times or we're in intense pain like sometimes just to say look I'm just going to watch a movie or whatever it is can be a really helpful thing to do so I don't think what we're talking about here this is something a flavor that really came through from Amishi Jha's work for me is the sense of we often tend to mistake mindfulness or attention for a sort of, in a way, the um, the attention systems when under stress, you know, it's sort of like that, a broad, soft, open awareness, for instance, um, can turn into like a sort of jumpy, slightly anxious deer in the headlights thing. And I think it's really easier for us to start thinking that's what mindfulness practice is. I need to be constantly on the lookout for something that's happening. And it's it's not really that, like just, just have a sort of broad thread running so you, you you just sort of notice oh my mind my mind's starting to be pulled in this direction or you're aware just being aware of my mind's jumping around all the time you know it's not necessarily having to make a problem out of it i don't know if i'm explaining that very well <laughs> yeah sure karen do you want to have a crack <laughs> came to me as you were speaking, Shadhanaya, is, is about intention and making decisions. So if I am in intense pain and I need a distraction, I'm making a decision that I need to do this for myself now, and that's one thing. Um, and that's kind of, that's, you know, not, that's to me quite different to creating white space or taking white space uh, opportunities that may arise after you've had a time of distraction or maybe even in that time of distraction because you've uh, come out of taking a, a more of a third party approach in that space you then might have space for white space within that kind of distraction if you see what I mean um, so I think it is helpful those things you're describing are helpful and useful and it can be I think also useful I mean, even as what Savannah D was describing earlier with, you know, 12 minutes, you intentionally set up that space to have space, but you, you, you set it up with intention. So you could set up, you know, you could do a meta practice before you say, I'm going to sit for 12 minutes 
and mm. drink a cup of tea and, mm. and you know gaze at the sky yeah so yeah. that thing of white space too was not i think sometimes we can mistake that for a sort of uh just sitting meditation practice yeah, yeah. and it's not really it, it really is more like just doing nothing yeah so it's like whatever pops into your mind whatever pops into your awareness is completely okay it's, it's sort of much open and softer yeah than that so and, and i think really what um what's being drawn out in all of this is is more that we have such a tendency to habitual doing and habitual distraction so it's like can we instead of immediately putting on the stereo when we feel uncomfortable we say i'll listen to some nice music <laughs> you know it's like yeah can we take five minutes to just like kind of just sit and hear the birds and have a cup of tea and then you know it's about taking back some of that space because it's more that those distractions helpful as they can be become unhelpful because they just become they start to fill all of our space yeah okay see you shot now i know we're um we're sort of up on time but i've just got one question from rebecca, rebecca yeah thank you no it was more just a realization um hearing the, the conversation which was that I have noticed just now an aversion to wasting time. It's like the, mm -hmm. the conditioning that I'm under is that if there's a spare spot of time, don't waste any time. And so that was just a beautiful realization. I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And what is wasted time? You That's know? right. What conditions present, support creativity? Yeah. And, yeah. and if you're present, it's not joy. wasted. Every moment that you're present to is not wasted. I think, well, I think we'll, we'll, maybe we'll have to, have to wrap Where it up. does that message come from anyway? Yeah. <laughs> yep, it's conditioned. Yeah. Yana Mudra? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, if we, we, we'll, we'll uh, wrap it up now and really um, thank you to Savannah D and Yasha Karana for, for all your um, hard work and also for, for everybody um, attending. I mean, I have I have dropped in the, the donations link, um, you know, into the chat. So 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 please, if you are able to um, put something in there, would be most appreciated. Um, but thank thank you all, and um, have a lovely rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Yep. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm.